Hi guys, Alicia from Morning Hawk Creations. Today's tutorial is going to be doing an elk in charcoal. Alright, welcome back. So for today's tutorial, along with executing this elk, uh, we're also going to be going over some of the visual benefits of following the rule of thirds or using a one-third composition in your design. Techniques we're going to cover with charcoals are going to help you troubleshoot other design elements and other subjects when using contrast and texture as part of your elements of design. Some of the materials we're going to use are going to include a kneaded eraser, our usual blending stumps and tortillions, a 2B medium, a 4B soft, the 6B extra soft, an HB, and a carbon pencil. The paper is going to be a Strathmore Smooth. It's 12 by 9 and the internal box on this is 5x7. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to post them below. And if you'd like some more information, feel free to follow us on Facebook on Morning Hawk Creations. Enjoy! The rule of one-third, or the rule of thirds, takes your overall design and divides the page into nine equal sections. You can have this tool brought up on your camera to help you in your photography. However, in this shot, the tree overpowers the overall layout of the shot. Now when I take my grid and I lay it over this original shot, you can see the eye lays down on that grid, but we're going to take that grid and lay it out again on the 9 by 12 piece, which is the overall artistic layout. Just like with my cats and all my other pieces, we're going to start with the eye. Because the elk is the focus of this piece, I like to make uh, the eye one of the most prominent features and therefore uh, is always one of the first things that uh, I start with. Elk like sheep and cows have a horizontally slitted eye. and the eyes are a dark uh, chestnut or umber color. Now elk, like most deer, have hollow hair and can be very, very stiff. Now it helps that that hollow cord hair uh, helps keep the heat in in the winter and helps keep them cool in summer. Um, but it also makes for a very coarse uh, coat and so the uh, facial hair uh, that, like if I was doing a horse uh, or even a cow, uh, would be blended in so it looks softer. Uh, the directionality hairs uh, that tell you where the hair is going on the face of the elk, uh, we're going to keep quite a bit of those uh, directionality strokes very prominent in uh, the final version of this. And we're not going to blend them in so they're soft. Now this elk was actually uh, photographed out at Shalom Wildlife Sanctuary uh, out in West Bend, Wisconsin in October. So it was uh, right in the midst of the rut season. So uh, if you're not familiar with what a rut is, uh, that's when the Females all come into estrus, which is when they're uh, primed and ready for breeding, and the males uh, sporting those really huge racks uh, generally battle each other for not only territory, but uh, females and uh, breeding rights. Linked below, I'm going to post uh, a page that uh, I found because we can no longer do music with these uh, tutorials. So uh, there's something called Ambient Mixer. So what I did is I came up with kind of a blend of, of sounds to kind of go, uh, go with this. Uh, so it's not just me talking. Um, but you can have some kind of maybe mood inspiring uh, soundtrack in the background. Uh, which is meant to be somebody just kind of hiking maybe through the Rockies. And the occasional elk bugle to kind of keep the uh, tone going there. So 
So there is a darker patch of fur that is between the antlers here, and it's longer than the the surrounding fur. So it's 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 longer and uh, it stands up and goes in a little bit of a different directions. And uh, it's about it, it's a little chestnut colored, a little more red, uh, deeper color than the uh, facial hair and the hair around the eye and uh, down by the ears. And the hair there is about probably three or four inches long. Um, it goes in different directions, and I'm sure it's there to uh, help pad uh, any encounters that the uh, elks might incur with battling and rubbing while marking territory. And keep in mind, um, you know, the... Uh, the elks, while they're a, a deer, this is an 1,100 pound animal. An elk can get anywhere from about 400 pounds to 1,100 pounds. And the rack on its head is can be four feet wide and tall. And so uh, I'll, some people may be thinking, oh, well, it's, it's just a deer. It'll be okay. It'll run in the other direction. Uh, an elk in rut will not necessarily walk away and go in the other direction. Uh, an elk and rut is uh, a rather unpredictable creature and if you counter it in the wild, be it the um, uh, Estes National Park or out in the Rocky Mountains or the Grand Tetons, uh, they can be really rather formidable uh, and very, very dangerous. So uh, if you decide to go out in the National Parks of the United States, uh, please exercise some caution. Don't forget to check in with your park rangers and if your park rangers uh, give you some advice uh, they on site would know far more than a visitor uh, about the uh, behavior of what's going on with the herds that are native to their parks or migrating through their parks. So we're working on the nose and this is the other dark point to the anatomy on the steer uh, that is not the rack itself. And a elk's nose is two things. It's kind of textured like a dog's nose, and it's moist, unlike um, maybe a horse's nose that is very velvety, um, or like a cat's nose, which is textured but dry. Uh, so we're going to have to use a slightly different stroke. We're not using uh, straight lines like we are in the fur right there, um, but kind of a rounded stroke uh, to denote kind of the uh, round pattern uh, that is the texture on that nose. And again, going with an awful lot of contrast in order to uh, convey the uh, feeling that it, it, it's not just a textured, but it is moist. And there are not a whole lot of guidelines that I have up on this uh, rough drawing, uh, mostly because I wanted to uh, really let you guys see that um, even if you're redoing your rough drawing and reusing it, um, it's all in the interpretation of what is between the spaces and the technique that you use to execute uh, your, your pieces. Now this exact same line drawing I'm going to redo on another tutorial for watercolors where we're going to focus more on light and color rather than uh, contrast. So a real heavy line on that lip. Now the lips on these elks are black and so not only do I have to convey the, uh, the, the uh, depth from the top lip to the bottom lip and the shadow, but also uh, a little bit of the skin, which is where the fur stops growing. And one of the things that is not real prevalent in the picture, it's the reference picture, is how many uh, different shapes and, and contours are in where the, between the eye and the nose, uh, which kind of make this elk's face really rather interesting. And there's a definite line that I keep going back to, which is that line that normally would just 
curve smoothly up the face like on a horse that uh, they would have that uh, circle where the directionality of the fur changes right underneath the forelock but on this elk that line just becomes a crest from the eye right down the side of the face to the nose. Another feature of these elk is that uh, magnificent kind of beard that comes off of from the chin down through the neck. So you're going from uh, a coarse fur um, that is anywhere from maybe a quarter inch and an inch uh, down the chin just like that and then it gets uh, six to eight to ten inches long down in the neck and in the throat and it also changes color so it goes again from that kind of creamy warm brown to a real deep chestnut and in some cases can even be black but there's also patches of fur missing there from them in their rut and battling and uh, when they uh, rub up on trees um, and the wear and tear that they go through with the rut. A little bit more texture down around the mouth, making sure that we've got some definition. And I do jump back and forth between uh, different pencils, depending on if I want a real sharp line uh, that I want to retain or if I just kind of want to uh, give a nice dark shadow and I'm going to blend it out. The reason I'm going back to this eye, and I go back to that eye a lot, is I want it to look attentive without necessarily um, I want them to have a very intelligent look. Uh, I see a lot of, of elk artwork where uh, effectively what is a large game animal has a tendency of looking very um, either doughy-eyed and innocent or has very little intelligence. And so I am always going back to the center of my reference, which is honestly the focus is the eye, um, which I get an awful lot of compliments to make sure that it's got the the look that I want and the uh, attributes that I want. If it looks a little too doughy, I'll uh, adjust it. Um, probably uh, small and small one. <laughs> Make the uh, the glint in the eye, the reflection in the eye, a little bit smaller. If the uh, pupil's a little too small, um, the animal may come our way a little bit frightened looking. Um, so I'm, I keep going back and forth with that eye to make sure that it's got what I want. So one of the things that's kind of important to note when I'm doing this ear is that ear is full of hair, uh, much like a wolf's ear versus your dog's ear. So if you're just kind of coming up with an idea of what you want to kind of do with an elk or something, uh, and you're using other animals for references, um, this ear is very well insulated. Um, and the reason that the line is down the center is because literally there's very little room for seeing the internal uh, scope of that ear. Just got to bring that down, give that ear a little bit of anchor. Get up into these antlers a little bit. Now the thing with these antlers, and there's going to be a whole big section on these antlers, is that they're very dark toward the bottom and very textured on the bottom. And I do not want them to overpower the entire piece. One of the hardest things about doing elk as an art piece is that those racks are so incredibly huge. Um, they are the, the piece of the anatomy on these animals that is the signature piece and uh, drawing them in a balanced manner can be exceptionally challenging. So I am going to leave those for last. So if you're looking at this, you're going to kind of notice how right now, if you took away the antlers, 
Uh, this elk looks an awful lot like a cow. And there are quite a few similarities that this elk does have with a cow. In general, uh, the overall shape of the head is very similar to that of a cow with that wide muzzle. Uh, textured wet nose. Cows uh, have a wet nose, they don't have a dry nose. Um, the ears, proportionally compared to a cow, are a little bit smaller and they're much heavily uh, furred than a cow's is. So now we're going to get this cow looking elk to look a bit less like a cow. Make sure our nose and our eye are a really good, nice focal point. Always bearing in mind that when we get this rack done, that rack is going to really draw the eye away. So I want to give the eye an awful lot of texture to look at when I'm going down this. Um, so we're, we're keeping with the texture in the face, and then we're, we're going to carry that down into that, that large, thick, uh, main beard that is the fur that goes down the neck. And sometimes if you're out in the Rockies or out west and uh, you see some of these elks in the wild uh, what you'll find out is that they have created something called a wallow, and a wallow is kind of like what a, uh, it sounds like, something like a pig. Uh, when these antlers come in and these elk lose them every year, uh, they're covered in velvet, which kind of feeds in nutrients to the uh, antlers and helps them grow. But once that uh, velvet dies, it's just like a scab. It becomes very, very itchy and irritating to these elk. And along with having sight glands up in the top by that little tuft of chestnut hair and around their eyes, um, they uh, not only scent mark with those scent glands, but um, they take those antlers and they rub them on just about everything they can get their little deer-like hands on. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a tree or a rock, uh, branches, other elk, um, the ground. Uh, you'll find these huge uh, wallows out west with elk in rut where they've taken those antlers and just tore them into the ground and you'll see amusing pictures um, online of elks that are in the midst of the rut um, just covered in grasses and chunks of dirt from uh, tearing up the ground with their antlers in these wallows. So because the base of these antlers is going to be so big and such a, a, a dark spot, we have to kind of balance it out with another dark spot, which is going to be the, uh, the uh, beard slash uh, neck hair, uh, this kind of main thing that they've got going on, which has a tendency of being really dark. And it does go from about the jawline all the way down the neck and into the shoulders. So we're going to use that as kind of a counterpoint to these antlers which are going to spread out and give a similar texture to all of this hair which gives you a lot of little curved lines and small texture but a high contrast texture to kind of a constricted same sort of a pencil stroke got a little bit of a ridge going up the back here. If you're not careful, you could easily have lost this little ridge, and I kind of think it uh, gives this elk a little bit of something. But notice how all the tones that uh, and the contrast and the, and the lights and the darks that we're using in um, this neck mane here uh, don't detract from the overall headpiece and they just kind of add to it. It gives your eye something to roll around, but because there's so much contrast in the eye, 
and down into the nose. So far we have not lost our point of focus. Now we're going to get into these massive antlers. So like I said, these antlers can be uh, four feet across and four feet back. So um, you're talking 50 to 150 pounds in, in a rack that can visually be very hard to deal with when you're talking about uh, drawing a deer in your composition. And down at the base of the antlers, it's very, very rough. Uh, there's little bumps and grooves and there's dark spots, uh, dark lines, where um, uh, either it's dirt or it could be the remnants of um, the velvet that rubbed off. Remember that, vel that velvet that grows on there is very rich in blood and uh, can stain those antlers. But as you get out toward the tips, they become smoother because uh, when that velvet dies, it becomes exceptionally irritating and itchy, uh, and those elk are going to take those antlers and just rub them on just everything and anything. It's uh, very common when you see an elk, or you get into elk territory, um, where they're in rut, to see a whole bunch of trees just torn up, missing bark, uh, branches missing. Um, it looks like a uh, little bit of swath of destruction from uh, these very, very large animals. So the two things we need to work on when we're working on the base of these antlers is keeping that rounded texture and, and make sure we're keeping the rounded form of these antlers and retaining uh, the textural tone and conveying that uh, between the roughness at the base of the antlers and where it becomes more smooth toward the tip. So when I said using contrast uh, and texture uh, to help troubleshoot your layout, uh, these antlers are actually, they're really hard to figure out and they can get really confusing really quick. Um, and there were several times I had to just stop and do exactly what I said in uh, the description. And that is to look at the current tine or uh, prong on these antlers and figure out okay, where does this prong end um, and where does the next one pick up and how do I tell the difference between the two? And that may just have to be a practice that you'll have to get into of which is the light and which is the dark and how do you tell the difference between the two? Um, and, and look at your reference pictures, look at them and then sit down and ask yourself that question. And if, if there's nothing wrong with that, that's good analytical thinking. Um, when you're getting confused in a piece, whether it's this elk or any other piece of, of art, um, when you're trying to tell foreground from background, how are you going to depict that this part of your paper is different from this piece, whether it's anatomy, foreground, um, texture, landscaping, it really doesn't matter. Um, do use your reference picture if you're using one or analytically think for yourself if you're just kind of coming up with your composition how do you want to tell the story of what is in front and what is in back so like with the area that I'm working in here there's two things that change uh, one is you have this definite curvature that goes toward the right uh, with the antler that's in front and with the left antler which is in back the lines that are the growth lines on the antler and the overall tone of the antler are much lighter, which it, I had to sit down and actually think about how I was going to render that because uh, the two of them kind of blended together. And the other thing that became very uh, kind of sit back and think about how it's going to do it is there's a double tine on the front antler, which is the right antler. And uh, I was trying to figure out how I was going to uh, get that to look like it was part of the front antler and not the back antler. how to convey the, uh, the highlight that went from that right prong, that front prong through those little nubs into the second prong uh, became kind of something I had to ponder for a few minutes.
The other thing that's kind of tricky about doing these antlers is, um, you know, we've gone over uh, how on the base of these antlers, they're very textured. Um, there's a lot of little nubs and uh, grooves. As they go up, they become smoother. And of course, you have to figure out how to translate that into paper, how that's going to look, uh, uh, the difference between an actual groove and just dirt or... Um, the discoloration, um, but there there is that that one thing. There is decoloration on the whiteness that is the uh, tips of these antlers, so uh, they have a tendency of being a little mottled uh, with whatever it is that stained them, whether it's dirt or blood or um, whatever it is that the elk have gotten into. Um, and I. Not entirely sure that when they get out of the rut and these antlers fall off, or the uh, velvet falls off the antlers, that they are quite as pristine as one would think. So by uh, taking and coming up with the sharp edges like we are in this back antler versus the uh, front tine, um, we're kind of pushing one forward and one back. Um, and then it becomes just kind of a little bit of a battle on how you're going to convey um, the actual rough texture to just discoloration. And sometimes that can be done by uh, softening uh, your strokes with your pencil. And the growth lines on these antlers follow the antlers out. They don't go around like a ring on a tree. Um, and those give you some really strong leading lines, which is another one of those things that factors into this layout. So it does give you these leading lines that follow the antler out. Now the original layout, as I showed you in the beginning of this video, one of my lines on my grid fell right on the eye. And that is where I want my focus to be, is on the eye. Uh, but there was so much stuff in the background that if I stayed with just that blanket layout um, with all the trees in the back and then that fallen tree that's in the front that I'm sure the elk had been running on, um, it would have become way too busy. So by laying it out a second time and coming up with a second layout, I'm able to convey um, the large height um, of these antlers by actually bringing in the background frame tighter and letting the antlers go out uh, farther from the um, from the uh, beginning layout. So when I laid it out on this uh, 9 by 12 paper, um, the eye stayed on a point in my grid and then we let the antlers take out over uh, the grid on the, on the on the secondary layout, giving a visual leading line in and out. But because we're going to retain the landscape box, it gives you something to focus on. So even back here, um, as far back as the uh, ends of this rack, right, this uh, antler right here, and on the end of this rack, we still have a lot of texture that we have to convey. And in this paddock, there were three bull elk, I think one that was the uh, predominant bull, and then two younger bulls. This is one of the two younger bulls. Um, And now we're going to kind of deal with um, that tree in the background, which was in the shot. It was really overwhelming. Now, I'm not going to copy that tree verbatim. Um, it does kind of have some characteristics that I liked. And that is um, it gave me a lot of lines kind of going from the tip of that antler down into the corner, which will then kind of blend into the lines that make the lower uh, neck, mane, and uh, beard for this elk and go back up into the eye. So it does have kind of a circular pattern. 
um, but it also mirrors the strokes that we're using in a much larger format that I'm already using on the elk, be it both in the rack and on the fur. So we're going to kind of use this as a secondary anchor point to balance out those antlers. Kind of a grounding point. Because we're putting a box inside of our layout, I want to make sure that these lines stay exceptionally straight. And so, yeah, I'm going to bring the ruler in, and we're really going to shade this, uh, this tree down. I want to make sure I'm not blending this tree down past the border here. I don't really need it to be as dark as it is in the picture. I don't want it to be overwhelming. I do want it to kind of give me a leading line from the edge of that antler back down into the main frame of the page and then be a kind of a corner anchor for the overall piece. So while I'm using the rule of thirds, I'm actually doubling that rule of thirds up. So not only using it um, on the original composition where the line would go right through there, um, but when I back out into the 9x12, doubling it up again so that the overall box that I'm using has uh, that eye still in that uh, one-third line. Now the only thing is is that once I got out here uh, with these antlers, uh, you kind of lose the antlers in if I leave this background white. So I had to give uh, some amount of darkness so that the we didn't lose the antlers uh, in this box. They don't just kind of fade off into nothing. So I'm just going to give it a really soft layer of trees just to help uh, give some context to the frame of this. I don't want it to be bare. Uh, I want it to kind of feel like perhaps you happen to have been, you know, use your imagination if, you, if he's looking in a window or, if, you know, this just happens to be a breaking the fourth wall kind of thing. But again, not really going as dark in my values or my tones um, as I am with uh, the actual subject. This is just kind of a soft um, kind of anchor where we're going to make sure that we're giving some definition and bringing that rack out of the page, out of the uh, the original frame that it's in. And notice that I didn't I didn't bring any of those down to trees or that busy background. I only brought that foreground tree that was down. And that's because uh, it really felt to me that th those background trees uh, really became very detracting. And I want the subject here to just be the elk. I don't want to have to fight um, anything for uh, its attention. For the mass amount of this elk, uh, that 6B Extra Soft did not come in. Where that 6B Extra Soft came in was uh, a lot in this background where I can create those really soft, uh, dark accents. And for some of these lighter ones, uh, just get it into that, uh, that dark area, pick up some of that charcoal, and then just kind of drag it off into... Uh, other parts uh, where the tonal valor value is uh, lighter and softer. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have your pencil on this paper 100% of the time. Alright, just kind of rounding it out so that uh, 
we don't have this background kind of letting the viewer's eye wander off the page again, we're going to kind of use that frame that we created. Bring some more trees in. And we're really just hinting at these trees. These trees could be any tree. Um, and if you wanted to go and do some research online, I'm sure you could find a decent selection of trees that are native to North America that have different kinds of barks and textures. But I just really want to give the Im the implication that there is some tree and some growth around this elk. And that's it. So if you'd like some more information, you can feel free to uh, follow me on Facebook. It's Morning Hawk Creations. Or you can post a comment below. And I hope you found this very informative. And I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, guys.